living la vida loca. This show is changing lives. We talking about your diet, trying to get you feeling bright. Cut up them avocados, fry some eggs. Time to explore the longest running health podcast, hosted by Jimmy Moore. Time to give up the crappy garbage. We're getting into ketosis. Every day is a new step to your goal. Yeah, you're getting closer. Motivated and focused. Don't stop, just go. Time to get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the Living Low Carb Show.com. So today, you guys, I have a brand new study I want to tell you about in my grubby little hands here. And it actually came out in the journal, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Very highly prestigious journal. Uh, if you look at the big journals when it comes to getting published in a nutritional health journal, journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association is the top one. And then the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition is right below JAMA. So this just came out uh, last month. And the title of the paper, The Carbohydrate Insulin Model, A Physiological Perspective on the Obesity Pandemic, uh, and there are a bunch of authors on this paper. You will know a few of the names if you are familiar in the low-carb community. David Ludwig is the lead author, but you've got other people on here. Arne Astrup, uh, I'm trying to see people you would know. Gary Taubes is also on this list. Uh, Ronald Krauss is on this list. Jeff Folick, Eric Westman, Walter Willett, Will Yancey, and Kara Eberling. These are all really... Uh, familiar names in the world of low carb and ketogenic research, not vilifying fat types of research. So I wanted to go over this study that literally just came out so you can get all the details of what this was all about. So let's read the abstract. According to a commonly held view, the obesity pandemic is caused by the overconsumption of modern, highly palatable, energy-dense processed foods, which is exacerbated by a sedentary lifestyle. So in other words, the common notion of the reason why we are obese, obese is we eat too many calories and we don't expend enough calories. However, obesity rates remain at historic highs despite a persistent focus on eating less and moving more as guided by the energy balance model. This public health failure may arise from a fundamental limitation of this hypothesis. Look, we've never had the whole calories in, calories out, uh, eat less, move more, ever, ever studied in a research paper. It's just never been looked at. It's just assumed. If you're going to get healthy, that's the way you do it. And so we haven't looked at that. We haven't looked at why, after all these years of telling people eat less, move more, why aren't we seeing obesity rates go down? Conceptualizing obesity as a disorder of energy balance restates a principle of physics without considering all the biological mechanisms that promote weight gain. And that's so true. It's not just about energy in, energy out. There are hormonal effects that are always forgotten whenever you're looking at obesity. There's a lot of moving parts to this, which they're going to talk about in this study. An alternative paradigm, the carbohydrate insulin model, proposes a reversal of this causal direction. According to this model, the carbohydrate insulin model, increasing fat deposition in the body resulting from the hormonal balances uh, or responses, excuse me, to a high glycemic diet, high carb diet, drives positive energy balance. So this, uh, this theory provides a conceptual framework with testable hypotheses for how various modifiable factors influence energy balance and fat storage. So rigorous research is needed to compare the validity of both the eat less, move more model and the carbohydrate insulin model, uh, which have substantially different implications for obesity and to generate new models that best encompass the evidence. So that's the abstract of this study. Um, and they're so right. We need to have a side-by-side -side comparison of the carbohydrate insulin model, which is basically keto, low carb, eating that way to manage hormones versus eating calories to a minimum, ex exerting calories and trying to make this calorie balance, this calorie, so-called calorie deficit happen. That obviously has been what we've been under for decades now. And how's that working for us? I wouldn't say it's working very well. Introduction of the study. 
The last century has witnessed fundamental developments in our understanding of the biological basis for obesity. Many lines of investigation demonstrate that body weight is controlled by complex and interconnected systems involving multiple organs, hormones, and metabolic pathways. Common genetic variants acting on these systems may explain around 20% of the population having a, a higher BMI. Rare mutations have been identified that can also cause obesity in humans. Animal models have been generated in which mutation of specific gene will yield susceptibility to or protection from obesity. Those are very rare though. That is not the norm. They are the exception. These genetic and molecular insights lay the foundation for many of the scientific models for obesity and that explains why individual susceptibility to changing environmental conditions is out there. However, in view of the rapid worldwide increase in BMI, despite relatively stable genetic susceptibility, scientific explanations for this pandemic must consider environmental factors. So that's what they're laying out the basis for this paper today is they want to make sure people realize it's not just calories in, calories out. During the last century, two models addressing environmental causes of obesity have emerged in the dominant energy balance model. Energy dense, tasty, modern processed foods are the things that are driving a positive energy balance through increased intake and thereby resulting in fat deposition. In the carbohydrate insulin model, a crucial effect of diet is metabolic by influencing substrate partitioning. Rapidly digestible carbohydrates acting through insulin, one of the master hormone, and other hormones in the body causes an increased fat deposition and thereby drives a positive energy balance. In this review, in this paper that I'm reading from, they provide the most comprehensive formulation of the calorie hypothesis along with the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis, arguing, arguing that the carbohydrate insulin is better uh, a better reflection of the knowledge of biology of body weight than using energy balance, specifically uh, recommending testable hypotheses to help resolve the controversy and call for a constructive discourse amongst scientific camps on this question of critical public health importance. I can tell you, I have been in this game for 17 years. I've been promoting low carb diets. I've been going to different conferences where the research is out there. Um, and I can tell you, there is no, in the mainstream, there is no having this, this debate over the calorie hypothesis versus carbohydrate insulin. They don't want the debate. Why? Because they know if it comes down to hormonal impact, they lose. They lose badly. And it's not even close. And yes, you can lose weight cutting calories and exercising uh, more and eating less. You can, you can lose weight that way but they never bring in the sustainability, the ability to have your satiety taken care of so you don't feel so hungry between meals. This is where the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis comes into play. I think carbohydrate insulin hypothesis, yes, it works because of the hormonal balance that happens, lowering of the insulin and, and managing the hormones better, but some of it is just a spontaneousness in the body feeling great, being well-nourished, being uh, satisfied with what you're eating, allowing you to go long periods of time between meals, that's where some of the benefits of this come into play. But they never want to talk about that. Okay, so let's get into uh, more of the paper. And if you just joined us, I got a brand new paper published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It's called The Carbohydrate Insulin Model, A Physiological Perspective on the Obesity Pandemic. It's got all the who's who in the world of ketogenic research David Ludwig, Eric Westman, Jeff Follett, Gary Taubes, uh, Will Yancey, Ron Krause, on and on and on. All right, let's get back to the paper. Obesity conceptualized as an energy balance disorder. This is what is out there. Obesity is commonly considered a disorder of energy balance, calories, surrounded by highly palatable, heavily marketed processed foods. Many people consume more energy than they burn an imbalance exacerbated by having a sedentary lifestyle with the surplus deposited into body fat. According to this view, the foundation of obesity management 
is control of energy balance by decreasing the intake, eat less, and increasing expenditure, move more. For example, the USDA Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2020 to 2025 just came out uh, last year. They state, to achieve weight loss, an energy deficit is required. An influential textbook also concluded all diets that result in weight loss only do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce their total calories. Importantly, this energy balance uh, model uh, considers all calories exactly the same. They're metabolically alike for practical purposes. Thus, specific foods or diets may produce variable amounts of weight gain or loss, but virtually only because of the energy intake related to hunger, satiety, satiation, hedonic effects. That's the, when your brain gets excitable, that's hedonic effect. Think about eating a Dorito uh, and how, oh, and you need to eat more. That's a hedonic effect. Or passive overconsumption, so the mindless calories, where you're just eating and eating and eating. You're not even paying attention to what you're eating. That's, uh, that's the passive overconsumption. Dietary treatment focuses on behavioral strategies to help people reduce energy intake, especially of the energy-dense, tasty uh, processed foods thought to drive a positive energy balance and to manage adverse effects. So this is amazing, guys. They do look at all calories as being equal. So the calories from uh, a ribeye steak and vegetables and the calories from a ding-dong, uh, Doritos, Coca-Cola, they're the exact same thing in the calorie model, in the energy balance model. And that's never made sense to me. And it's a very easy, it's a very easy thing to test. If you want to know, okay, is it a calorie thing? Put people on for a period of time, 1500 calories of ribeye steak, broccoli, cauliflower, let them eat that. And then have another group eat also 1500 calories, but of uh, Ding Dongs, Doritos, Coca-Cola. So if it's a calorie thing and it's nothing else other than calories, wouldn't they both have the same effect? You would think if it's only about calories. I have never seen that study and how easy would that study be to do? And you couldn't even, or you wouldn't even just look at weight loss, even though that's what culture wants to do. You kind of have to look at hormones. You kind of have to look at blood sugar you have to look at inflammatory markers. You have to look at basically subjective things like how does the person feel between those two meals? What were their hunger levels like? It would be a really intense study. I would love to see that study, but to date, that study has never been done. All right, so let's get back to the study. Tautologies and other limitations of the uh, energy balance model. The appealing simplicity of the ener energy balance model belies an inherent tautology. Weight gain, or more, more precisely, fat gain, can occur only when you have a positive energy balance, in the same way that a fever can only occur if the body generates more heat than it dissipates. However, these reiterations of the law of energy conservation ignore causality. During the pu uh, puberty, energy intake exceeds expenditure as body energy stores increase. Does increased consumption drive growth or does growth drive that increased consumption? Neither possibility violates any of the laws of physics, but the two perspectives have fundamentally different physiological bases and implications. Because the relation between energy balance and weight change is inseverable, statements regarding the importance of a negative balance provide no real meaningful information about its etiology. We don't know if... If the weight loss that's brought on by eat less, move more has anything to do with the reduction in the consumption or is dry, or if it will drive uh, consumption later, it's just, it's so such a convoluted theory that I'm surprised we still believe that in 2021. How about palatability and food intake? Regarding dietary drivers of obesity, uh, common versions of the energy balance model focus on the variety and the availability of these hyper palatable, energy dense processed foods. Clearly, people tend to eat more of those kinds of foods. And I will tell you the reason you eat more of those highly palatable processed foods is they have been stripped of all the great nutrition that's found in real whole foods. 
and then maybe they'll have a few synthetic vitamins put in it, but your body is seeking nutrients when you eat. They're not, it's not seeking calories, it's seeking nutrients, and nutrients are found in real whole foods. Uh, clearly, people tend to eat more of these that they find tasty and palatable. It seems to influence short-term food selection and the energy intake. However, surprisingly little evidence relates palatability directly to chronic overconsumption. So just because it's got high palatability doesn't mean you're necessarily just going to keep eating and eating and eating. For a lot of people, yes, but it's not axiomatic. Compared to a standard diet, a cafeteria diet composed of a variety of pres uh, presumably palatable human junk foods causes rodents to gain weight in several studies. Importantly, this diet differs in its macronutrients, its sugar, its saturated fat, fiber, differences in composition, not palatability, appear to cause the weight gain. In other words, it's the macronutrients. So to examine this issue, other research has already found highly palatable, non-nutritive uh, flavors to a standard diet for rodents. And when offered a choice, the mice showed a strong, persistent preference for the flavored over the unflavored. However, the flavored diet increased neither food intake, nor did they gain weight. In another study, uh, another researcher reported that rats rejected a bitter liquid diet in favor of a plain solid diet at the same nutrient composition when they were given a choice. But rats given only the bitter liquid diet increased energy intake and weight compared with those given only the solid diets. In other words, palatability has little to do with the amount they consume. And yet, what do we have here? Oh, it's hyper palatable foods causing people to eat more calories than they need. Therefore, that's why they gain weight. That's the theory that's out there. So this paper here is trying to lay the groundwork for that's not a valid way to look at this. Another study, no interventional studies in humans have demonstrated any causal relation between palatability and obesity, controlling for all the confounding factors such as macronutrient composition. Moreover, major putative uh, contributors to palatability, things like diet dietary fat, energy density, food variety, food processing, have not been shown to cause long-term weight gain. The very notion of palatability seems to lack an operational definition beyond fast foods, foods that are high in fat, sugar, and salt, or ultra-processed foods. In fact, palatability is not a fixed property of food, but rather something that is modifiable through learning and influenced by psychological state. In humans, insulin administration associated with mild, hypo, mild hypoglycemia preferentially activates uh, various parts of the brain, promoting a greater desire for more of these high calorie foods in general and possibly high carbohydrate foods. In the absence of any clear correlation to intrinsic food properties, hyperpalatable foods have been defined as those that drive food intake, which is another tautology for energy balance which simultaneously attributes increased food intake to hyperpalatable foods and then to obesity. So you see how they try to wrap up the whole eat less, move more, uh, energy balance, it's all about the calories. This is their only game. This is all they can rely on is, well, when you eat these foods, they're highly palatable, it makes you want to eat more of them and it's the more calories that's causing the, um, the increase in weight. All right, so what are some of the anomalies? By focusing on energy balance, characteristically through conscious control, the basic formulation of the energy balance model essentially disregards any knowledge about the biological influences of fat storage. This is what's amazing to me about doctors. They know all about physiology. They know the ways that the body works and functions to store body fat. They know these things. They know about insulin. They know about the pathways inside the body. They don't know about nutrition. That's the problem. If they knew about nutrition, then all of these pathways they learn about in the physiology of medical school would make a whole lot more sense. But they know. Keto can be hard. Tabulating, measuring, baking, taking three months to perfect one recipe and to mixed reviews. Did something die in here? Oh, I think it moved. And by that point, you give up your diet, find a dark corner, and stuff yourself with sugar, carbs, and regret. This, uh, isn't what it looks like. Well, this is where Keto Chow saves the day. 
the easiest, tastiest, ketoist meal replacement on the market. It's like ice cream melted in my mouth. Yes, but melted ice cream with all the protein, nutrients, vitamins, and electrolytes your body needs. Oh, that's cool. And with three starter kits, each with restaurant tips, keto food guides, and a ton of flavors to try, your taste buds and your waistline will thank you. Thank you. So grab your starter kit today at JimmyLovesKetoChow.com. It's so easy. Keto Chow. Make keto easy. Moreover, a central conundrum is to understand why the so-called body weight set point has increased rapidly amongst uh, genetically stable populations. In the 1960s, the average man in the United States weighed 75 kilograms. 75 kilograms is somewhere around 180 pounds. That was the average size of a man in the 1960s. Providing excess dietary energy to increase his weight to 90 kilograms, which is around 210 pounds, would have elicited biological responses, things like decreased hunger, increased energy expenditure, so that their gain would be resisted. Today, listen to this, the average man weighs over 90 kilo, restricting energy to reduce his weight to 75 kilo would elicit opposite responses. So by excluding a metabolic effect of the diet, common versions of the energy balance, eat less, move more, offer no explanation for what changes in the environment have dysregulated the biological systems that now counteract energy imbalance and resist weight change. And here's the thing, they wanna make it a calorie thing. They wanna say it's all about the calories, 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 but people are reducing calories and yet they're still seeing weight gain. So that begs the question, how is weight gain happening when calories are decreasing? And that's why they wrote this paper. We're gonna get into that here in a minute. Furthermore, conceptual adoption of the energy balance model has failed to stem this obesity pandemic. Who doesn't know about cut your calories? Who doesn't know about cut your fat? At this point, who doesn't know about that? That's been promoted since I was a little kid. That was a whole long time ago. And we have always believed, cut your calories, work out more, eat less, move more. That's what we've always uh, known. And yet the obesity pandemic continues to get worse and worse and worse. Governments and professional health organizations heavily promote this energy restriction, especially using low fat diets and exercising. Nutrition labels on packaged foods prominently display the calorie content. Personal responsibility to avoid excess weight gain is emphasized within patient care. In other words, they're blaming the patient for why they have obesity. Nevertheless, obesity prevalence continues to increase around the world, promoting speculation of complex formulations of this energy balance model, which addresses myriad biological, behavioral, environmental, and societal factors that really bring into question the practical translation of the energy balance model. And about darn time, we're seeing it in a study talking about the failure of the calorie hypothesis on obesity. So that's why this paper is so important. And it was in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This is like the prestigious of all prestigious nutrition health journals. It's big, you guys. So now they're gonna get into the carbohydrate insulin model and why it explains why obesity is so rampant today. The carbohydrate insulin model as a physiological explanation for the obesity pandemic. Like the energy balance model, the carbohydrate insulin model posits that changes in food quality are what drive weight gain. But it's not about energy, it's about hormonal impact. According to the carbohydrate insulin model, hormonal and metabolic responses to the sources of the dietary calories, not the mere calorie content, lie upstream in the mechanistic pathway. In other words, the carbohydrate insulin model proposes a reversal of causal direction. Over the long term, a positive energy balance does not cause an increase in adiposity, so fat on the body. Rather, it's a shift in the substrate partitioning which favors fat storage, which then drives the positive energy balance. Among modifiable factors, dietary glycemic load, in other words, low-carb foods versus high-carb foods, is of central importance. And they're so right. 
quality of the foods you consume will always supersede the calorie counts of those foods. I still want to see that study comparing a junk food, high carb diet to steak and vegetables. Make it isocaloric under the calorie uh, hypothesis. They should have the exact same results and we know they don't. Glycemic load is defined as the arithmetic, uh, arith arithmetic product of total carbs and glycemic index. Glycemic load is a, val a validated predictor of postprandial after eating glycemia, blood sugar, with consumption of typical foods, meals, and eating patterns. High glycemic load foods in in include processed grains, potatoes, foods with a high uh, sugar content, most fresh whole fruits, Minimally processed grains, legumes, nuts, and non-starchy vegetables have a moderate to even sometimes low glycemic load. Fats and proteins, which have no direct impact on your blood glucose after you eat, have a very nominal, if negligible, glycemic load. It's basically zero. The rapid absorption of glucose after consumption of a high glycemic load meal increases insulin secretion suppresses glucagon secretion, and then elicits a glucose-dependent uh, insulin response. Um, and this highly anabolic state for the first hours after eating promotes an avid uptake of glucose into the muscles, the liver, the adipose, and st stimulates lipogenesis, fat burning, in liver and the adipose tissue. In other words, you're, you're burning fat on the body. Three hours after eating, most of the nutrients from a high glycemic load meal have been absorbed by the digestive tract. However, the persistent anabolic actions from this response to the hormones slows the shift from uptake to the release of glucose in liver and fatty acids. Consequently, total metabolic fuel concentrations in the blood, things like glucose, uh, fatty acids, and ketone bodies decrease rapidly in the late postprandial phase, possibly to concentrations below that in a fasted state. Remember, this is high glycemic load that's doing this. The brain perceives this signal as indicating that critical tissues are deprived of energy. Did you get that? When you eat high glycemic load foods, the body thinks it's starving. So when it thinks it's starving, when you think a famine is about to happen, uh, in your life, uh, thankfully we've never had to deal with that here in America, but imagine for a moment that the possibility of not having food availability down the road, what would you start doing? You'd start storing it away, right? Well, that's what the body does when it starts storing body fat and, and stored body fat becomes obesity. And therefore, this carbohydrate insulin model is saying, look, if you're eating high amounts of carbohydrates, it's going to have a hormonal effect where the insulin goes higher and then it's going to think, oh my gosh, we have, we have, to, we have to preserve energy. We don't know how much uh, energy we're going to have down the road, so let's put it on the body for down the road. Pretty interesting, huh? Uh, uh, simultaneously, hunger and cravings for these high uh, glycemic load foods and all of the glycemic load foods that are high in, in glycemic load rapidly raise your blood glucose. They increase, setting the stage for a vicious cycle. Energy expenditure may also decline related to decreased fuel availability, hormonal, and especially uh, like the thyroid effects on metabolic pathways and the thermogenic tissue, or com uh, compensatory adaptations affecting the postprandial after eating state resting energy expenditure, muscle efficiency, and physical activity. So all of this is related to that high glycemic load. Thus, this marked increase in glycemic load across the population since the advent of low-fat diets. When you cut fat in people's diets, they have no choice but to increase carbohydrate, increase glycemic load foods. It was the unintentional, or I would say intentional, consequence of telling people to cut the fat in their diet in the 1980s. People obediently did it. You can only eat just so much protein before it's a natural cutoff. So what's left? It's carbohydrate. It's high glycemic load foods. So you have this uh, concurrent increase in total carbs, the exceptionally high uh, glycemic index of modern processed carbohydrates. They produce a sequence of pathophysiological events 
that limits metabolic fuel availability, uh, especially after eating, driving a positive energy balance. In other words, you're eating a lot more calories because you have to. Your hormones are out of whack. And at that point, you've got to bring them under control by not consuming those high glycemic load foods. Beyond glycemic load, the carbohydrate insulin model provides a conceptual framework for understanding how other dietary components, things like fructose, protein and fatty acids, fiber, food order, uh, things that like behaviors like meal timing, circadian rhythm, physical activity, as well as environmental exposures, anything that's considered an endocrine disruptor. All of those can also affect body weight through associated mechanisms uh, de novo lipogenesis, intestinal function and microbiome, muscle insulin resistance, chronic inflammation, epigenetic modifications. All of these are important rather than direct intake uh, of food and expenditure. In other words, it's a lot more than just calories in, calories out, eat less, move more. So this reversal of causal direction, although provocative regarding obesity, seems obvious in some other physiological states. The growth of a child drives uh, increases in intake over time. If you've ever had kids, you know when they're growing, they're eating. And they're eating because they're growing. If they didn't eat and eat enough for all the processes of growth, they wouldn't grow. This is why malnourished kids typically have stunted growth. Similarly, uh, similarly fetal growth with uptake of metabolic fuels from the maternal circulation, also drives overeating relative to expenditure in the mother and not the other way around. So if you're birthing a baby, you're gonna have more energy needs. If the carbohydrate insulin model is substantially correct, then the strategy to produce a negative energy balance through conscious control of food amount and physical activity is likely to fail most people. If you've ever been on a low fat diet, and you've obediently cut your calories and then you went down to the gym and you walked on the treadmill at you know three or four miles an hour and running on the treadmill and, and doing a spin class and all the things and you start looking to, for that to help produce weight loss and then it doesn't work, what happens? You go to see your doctor, you're not doing it hard enough. You're the reason it's failing because it works. It's the model. We all know it's the way you lose weight. You see how insidious this is? Restricting energy intake when consuming a high glycemic load, high carb diet would neither lessen the predisposition to fat storage nor would it diminish hunger while you're dieting. I would argue it would do exactly the opposite. It would increase hunger precipitously. Rather by further reducing metabolic fuel availability, hunger increases, energy expenditure declines. In contrast, weight reduction produced by carbohydrate restriction would actually decrease the insulin to glucagon ratio. It would enhance lipolysis, fat burning, and fat oxidation, and result in lower spontaneous food intake. When you well nourish your body, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, even a paleo diet, when you feed your body good nutrition, it rewards you by saying, okay, you're cool. You don't need to eat again. And you stay calm. There's no hunger. And you spontaneously reduce your calories. Restriction of, restriction of carbohydrate intake to very low amounts with the consumption of a ketogenic diet may actually elicit additional mechanisms, including the biological activation of ketone bodies, a possibility that's beyond the scope of what they looked at in this review. But all of that is why the carbohydrate insulin model could explain why obesity uh, is out of control because we're doing exactly the opposite. We're doing the high glycemic load, high carb approach, and that's not served us well. Predictions as well as testable hypotheses arising from the carbohydrate insulin model. The mechanistic relations lead to numerous testable hypotheses. Key findings from laboratory animal and human research are considered in the following table. So they got this nice little table. Let me take a quick little gander at it. Yeah, they're just basically saying, okay, here's the various pathways about how you can test the high glycemic load diet versus the low glycemic load diet, how fat storage is related. You can put in the genetic markers, but those are minimal. Most of this is directly tied to your diet and your lifestyle. 
So let's take a look at some of the things they look at as testable things to see how good this carbohydrate insulin model is at explaining obesity. Number one, hormonal response to glycemic load. <clears throat> so the effects of glycemic load on pancreatic hormone and in cretin secretion are well established. Uh, there was a, a review 50 years ago that found carbohydrate increases the insulin to glucagon ratio by not only stimulating insulin secretion, but also paracrine suppre uh, suppression of glucagon secretion. After a 60% compared with 20% carb meal, the integrated insulin to glucagon ratio was seven-fold higher in those adults who habituated to a high compared with a low-carb diet. Glycemic load also affects incretin hormone secretion. Oral glucose or a high GI uh, meal rapidly stimulated this secretion produced in the proximate small intestines. Conversely, a low GI meal had a greater effect on glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, produced in the intestines. So that's one thing they could test. Number two, insulin and tissue-specific insulin sensitivity. Insulin sensitivity is commonly measured at the whole body level, obscuring critical differences amongst tissues. A previous study infused rats with insulin by mini pump, resulting in well-tolerated hypoglycemia, that's low blood sugar. By day four of infusion, glucose utilization, uh, GLUT4 expression, lipoprotein lipase activity, and lipogenesis were increased in the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, whereas muscles developed insulin resistance. These contrasting effects persisted when hypoglycemia was prevented by glucose infusion. Uh, another study showed that insulin administration produced uncoupling protein 1 and mitochondria respiration in brown adipose tissue. And within the physiological range, insulin regulates energy and uh, expenditure, uh, at least in part with a real fancy uh, UCP1 mRNA via, via peroxisome, proliferated, activated receptor. Don't worry about all the gobbledygook. Just know they're explaining the pathway as to how they could test this in a study. And they look at the brown and white adipose tissue in mice, a mechanism that uh, is easy to do in humans as well. Number three, these are all the testable hypotheses that would test the carbohydrate insulin model. Tissue-specific insulin sensitivity and fat storage, greater insulin sensitivity in white adipose tissue relative to metabolically active or energy sensing tissue will alter substrate partitioning in favor of fat deposition. So in support of this, mice with adipose specific ablation of the insulin receptor have reduced adiposity without a change in the energy intake. In other words, they kept the calories constant, but they wanted to see what impact would the quality of those calories have on these insulin receptors. They are also protected against age-related metabolic abnormalities. So that's another thing they could do. Number four, insulin, glucagon, and adiposity. In rodents, chronic insulin treatment increases food intake and adiposity, and these effects are disassociable. A study gave rats daily insulin and or saline injections, keeping food intake the same between both groups. After just four weeks, the insulin-treated rats had increased their fat mass and reduced their carcass protein. In other words, they lost lean mass off their body, muscle. Consistent with this finding, mice with genetically reduced insulin secretion have a higher energy expenditure and are protected from having diet-induced obesity. In humans, insulin and drugs <coughs> that increase insulin secretion or insulin sensitivity cause weight gain whereas those that decrease insulin secretion um, cause weight loss. Patients with type 1 diabetes undergoing an intensified insulin therapy for two months saw a 2.4 kilogram increase in body fat, which was associated with decreased energy expenditure and therefore not fully attributable to the dietary intake and urinary glucose. In other words, the insulin itself caused the weight gain, even though they didn't change anything about their diet shows you the power of the hormone insulin. Genetic variants associated with an increased insulin secretion predicted weight gain. Uh, pancreatic tumors that secrete insulin may actually cause weight gain as well, whereas those that secrete glucagon 
uh, cause weight loss. So if you're not familiar, uh, insulin is the hormone that brings blood glucose down. Glucagon is the yin and yang of insulin. It's the one that pushes your blood glucose up. And both are important hormones trying to keep your blood sugar in a very tight homeostasis. So that's another one that you can test. Are you tired of playing the mask game? Me too. That's why I wanted to tell you about the Unmask. This is a breathable, completely breathable. It covers, you can't even see that it's breathable, but it's breathable. Whether you're going on a plane, having to go into a store and wearing this thing, playthemaskgame.com is how you can get this mask. They come in all kinds of colors and everything. In fact, right there, you can see right through it what it is, but when you're wearing it, it does not look like it's anything different, but <sighs> it's breathable, baby. Playthemaskgame.com. Number five. G, uh, GIP dominant in cretin secretion and fat storage, the cardiometabolic benefits, which include weight loss of GLP-1 agonism are widely recognized. The, uh, the adverse effects of GIP, the in cretin with the most potent influence on insulin secretion, have come to attention, motivating a search for ther therapeutic antagonists. The GIP administration promotes pre-adipocyte differentiation and fat storage uh, in the brain inflammation, insulin resistance. Uh, the GIP receptor knockout mice are protected against all these dietary uh, induced obesity. Lots of testable hypotheses. I love that they're outlining it all here. And I hope since it's published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, you've got very prestigious researchers going, okay, put your money where your mouth is. Let's see how these are <coughs> in labs. Number six. Glycemic load, metabolic fuels, food preference, energy balance. Consumption of high compared with a low G, uh, GL meal results in reduced circulating metabolic fuel concentrations after three to five hours associated with altered substrate partitioning and energy expenditure. Spontaneous transient declines in blood glucose will predict hunger, meal initiation, uh, and energy intake. Insulin administrations, which lowers the concentration of all the metabolic fuels, causes hunger, and possibly a preference for high glycemic load foods. Indeed, endogenous hyperinsulinemia may mediate the cravings and binge eating habits associated with eating these high glycemic load foods through similar types of mechanisms. Hunger has also been observed with drugs that block sensing uh, or oxidation of those metabolic fuels, which a preference for carbohydrate has been found in many of the clinical settings. That's pretty interesting. Number seven, I think this is, yeah, there's one more after this. Number seven, uh, glycemic load, energy balance, and obesity. Remember, these are all testable hypotheses. In animal models, high compared with low GI diets increase adiposity independent of their energy intake in association with lower physical activity. Studies comparing high and low carb diets in animals have produced heterogeneous results, an issue that we will consider below. <clears throat> Most but not all acute studies in humans reports reduced hunger when you eat a low-carb diet, uh, reduced energy intake in the late postprandial state uh, as compared to a high glycemic index meal. Low compared with high-carb diets also increased total energy in in expenditure after two to three weeks. Over the long term, a high-fat diet results in more weight loss than a high-carbohydrate diet. Contrary to the expectation based on calories, because each gram of fat has nine calories, each gram of carbohydrate has only four. So if you, you have more density in the caloric content, but you actually have better results eating the higher fat versus the higher carb. Studies suggest a unique diet phenotype interaction in that individuals with high insulin secretion or other abnormalities of glucose appear especially susceptible to adverse metabolic responses and weight gain when they consume a high glycemic load diet. In uh, ad libitum fed male monkeys, ad libitum as much as you want to eat, a higher glycemic load high sugar diet compared with a lower glycemic load low sugar diet increased the adiposity without increasing total energy. That's amazing. However, the chronic effect 
of glycemic load on body composition in humans with control for energy intake has yet to be determined. So that's where a study would come in handy to take a look at that. And then the last hypothesis that they could test the carbohydrate insulin model, causal direction in experiments uh, of, of obesity, metabolic defects involving substrate partitioning and energy expenditure may manifest without or before having an increase in the food intake, demonstrating the conceptual plausibility of the fundamental features of the carbohydrate insulin model. In other words, before you overconsume, <coughs> you may be consuming foods, the high glycemic load foods, the high carb foods, that would exacerbate this long before you would get to the overconsumption of foods. So this sequence of events is well established in experimental uh, obesity uh, studies. Immediately after injury to uh, the hypothalamus, hyperinsulinemia develops, without any systemic insulin resistance and sympathetic nervous system tone is decreased. Importantly, spontaneous physical activity is reduced during the development of this obesity and increased fat deposition occurs even with the restriction of food intake similar to the control group. A similar sequence of metabolic events independent of their food intake occurs during the development of obesity with insulin administration. So when they shoot people up with insulin, they get obesity, and they eat a high GI diet, it's a recipe for continuing that obesity. Pragmatic and ethical limitations preclude such experiments in humans, though. In a prospective observational study, uh, increased adiposity better predicted decreased physical activity rather than the converse. In other words, moving more did not produce more weight loss. Um, it was the other way around. When you started gaining weight because you ate the wrong foods, over consumed carbohydrates, that led to a decreased activity. <clears throat> All right, some of the criticisms of the calorie, uh, of the carbohydrate insulin model. Uh, they talk about the genetics. Let me see if there's any good excuses here as to why this does not work, the criticism. So metabolic fuel concentrations in the blood are typically high, not low in obesity. So as with many physiolo physiological systems, causal mechanisms may be evident only during dynamic changes, not after compensation and reestablishment of new homeostasis. So sodium balance is negative initially. In other words, you're going to have higher weight initially with sodium balance being out of order, but not chronically. Uh, reducing circulating fuel concentrations have been documented early in the development of experimental ob obesity several hours after high GL, a glycemic load meal in humans. Um, as insulin resistance develops, metabolic fuel concentrations go up. Moreover, circulating fuels are at best a proxy for substrate sensing and oxidation. These may be disassociated with certain conditions such as insulin resistance or diabetes. So the carbohydrate insulin model posits a state akin to internal starvation, which is an acceleration of the fasting physiology uh, emerging in the late postprandial period. Studies of this are needed to test the hypothesis. Uh, they talk about rodent studies of high fat diets contradicting this, but I will, I will caution, I've never been a fan of looking at animal-based models to have human application. We look at animal-based models for, okay, Let's develop a hypothesis so that you can test in humans. But I'm not, I'm not really a fan of making any conclusions for humans based on what you see in animal-based rodent studies, especially. Uh, energy intake not reduced by low compared with high-carb diets in some feeding studies. Again, that would be something that you could test. Uh, energy expenditure is not increased by low compared with high-carb diets in some feeding studies. So again, something that you could uh, test in a lab. Weight loss is not substantially greater for low versus high carb diets in long-term study trials. I would argue a lot of those studies uh, that have looked at low carb diets compared with high carb diets, they only give them the intervention for three months, maybe six months. I think the longest I've seen is up to a year, but then they don't have to follow that intervention. And what's ha what happens in a lot of studies, uh, especially this guy, Frank Sachs, very popular in the calorie hypothesis movement. And he's just like, look, it's all about the calories. And his studies, that's what they would do. They give them intensive uh, amounts of 
here's how you do the diet. So they do a high carb diet and low fat for one group, low carb, high fat for the other group. And then after a while, they're like, okay, eat however you want. And it's like, by the end of the study, that they do this for, for three months, this intervention, and then for the rest of the year, they do this study and they say, okay, eat whatever you want. And they go back to eating the way they did. And so by the end, they're eating almost exactly the same diet and they have exactly the same weight loss effects. That's not studying anything. Uh, another one, some populations such as in Asia consume high glycemic load diets, yet they have relatively low rates of obesity. So again, this is where uh, culturally they have a predisposition for being able to handle eating those carbohydrates better than say Americans would. Um, but that's something that you could test. And then the straw man argument, some critics assert that the carbohydrate insulin model considers the actions of insulin only in postprandial period and only in the adipose tissue, noting that insulin affects adiposity independent of the carbohydrate. So that's, that's the criticism of this model. Clearly, insulin is a multifunctional hormone secreted in response to various dietary and non-dietary factors. However, the actions of carbohydrate on metabolism persist well beyond the after-eating state, the postprandial, <clears throat> as demonstrated by the second meal effect. So indeed, the car carbohydrate insulin model considers that substrate partitioning and fat deposition are determined by integrated actions of insulin together with other hormones and autonomic inputs in various organs, not just the adipose tissue. So to avoid confusion, it should be recognized that the name of a scientific model typically reflects major distinguishing features, in this case, carbohydrate and insulin, not the full scope of all the causal factors and mechanistic relations. Conversely, one might ask whether our formulation of the energy balance is also a straw man. In support of our argument, we show the overwhelming dominance of energy balance in textbooks and professional society statements, the importance of establishing this negative energy balance through decreased intake and increased energy expenditure. None of these articles nor the recent dismissals of the carbohydrate insulin model provide any kind of mechanistic a testable model to address the drivers of obesity. And that's what they're trying to attempt to do in this uh, paper here. Other logical fallacies, some might argue that the new iterations of the carbohydrate insulin model serve to move the goalposts, obscuring the contest of opposing ideas. But the relevant question is whether developmental stages of a model offer a consistent distinction from conventional thinking. They're just asking for a seat at the table of the discussion. That's all we want with the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. So they go into how you can resolve the controversies, uh, the definitive research needed to resolve persistent controversies will be challenging because the average increase in body weight throughout the last half century is attributable to the storage of one gram of extra fat per day, illustrating the difficulty in exploring causal mechanisms with such short-term studies. But this difficulty is no justification for basing scientific knowledge on inconclusive research, which is what the energy balance model is. It's not conclusive, never been proven in a study. The failure of the low-fat diet for obesity as, uh, as advocated throughout the late 20th century can be traced in part to reliance on weak evidence for short-term and confounding studies, better funding for nutrition research, and creative study designs will be needed. I have been asking for that for years. We need more funding for carbohydrate-restricted diets so we can test these models and see which one has the most veracity. Isn't that what science is about? Looking at competing theories and vetting them out by putting them up against each other and see what happens. Clinical and public health trans, uh, translation, calorie restriction for obesity treatment results in weight loss initially giving patients the impression that they have conscious control of the body, of the body weight, but predictable biological responses oppose weight loss, including decreased metabolic rate and elevated hunger. Therefore, ongoing weight loss requires progressively more severe calorie restriction, even as you increase hunger. And if you've gone on a diet, you know the miserable feeling that you just can't take it anymore and you binge and you give up. Uh, so translating this to public health may be especially problematic. To prevent obesity, the USDA advises Americans to stay within the calorie limits. 
Outside the research lab, there's no feasible way to measure individual energy requirements to a precision within even 300 calories per day. An overestimation would actually produce weight gain. For practical purposes, people must determine their energy uh, allowance empirically as the amount to which the body weight remains stable, which is yet another tautology. According to the carbohydrate insulin model, humans in the modern industrial food environment may have greater long-term control over what rather than how much they eat. By reducing the anabolic drive with a low carb diet, uh, patients may experience less hunger, improved energy levels, promoting spontaneous weight loss in the same way that uh, reducing fever without conscious control of heat balance. So a practical strategy is to substitute a high carb diet, refined grains, potatoes, sugars, with high fat foods, things like nuts, seeds, avocado, olive oil, allowing for a moderate intake of total carbs from whole kernel grains, whole fruits, legumes, and non-starchy vegetables. For those with special susceptibility, such as a high insulin secretion or severe insulin resistance, restricting total carbohydrates may be what's optimal for them. So in conclusion, it's a long study, but thanks for hanging in there. As with virtually all models of complex biological phenomena, the iteration of the carbohydrate insulin model presented here cannot provide a complete and precise uh, representation of all the causal mechanisms, nor does it preclude the existence of other causative influences. The value of a scientific model is in stimulating discourse and informing the design of the research. Premature claims to have falsified or refuted the carbohydrate insulin model are all based on weak and confounded evidence and they impede constructive scientific discourse. Controversy notwithstanding, important common ground may already exist between these two models. For example, hardwired hedonic preferences for sweet may be what's driving energy consumption, increased energy consumption of sugary foods, especially in the energy balance model. That in turn may also affect substrate partitioning through calorie independent mechanisms, which is consistent with the carbohydrate insulin model. In this sense, conventional notions of palatability and the metabolic effects of preferred foods would work in concert to drive fat accumulation. Or perhaps time-restricted eating, fasting, could reduce hunger and thereby facilitate calorie restriction in part through controlling these hormones. So as much as they want to fight about energy balance, it may come down to the hormones even in their model. The field of obesity should embrace paradigm clash as an essential step forward. Toward this end, investigators should first refrain from any hyperbole uh, of claims to have disproven or even proven alternative explanations of obesity. Second, they should also clarify the energy balance model, specifying contrasting causal and testable hypotheses. Third, form collaborations among scientists with diverse viewpoints to test predictions in rigorous and unbiased research. Fourth, to facilitate these aims, uh, depersonalize the debate, scrupulously avoiding any kind of ad hominem arguments. Rigorous research using complementary designs will be needed to resolve this debate, clarify a middle ground, and point the way to new explanations for why we have obesity. With the massive and growing burden of obesity-related diseases throughout the world, this work must be our priority. So guys, that is the study, once again, published in the September 2021 Journal of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, very prestigious journal. The title of the paper, The Carbohydrate Insulin Model, A Physiological Perspective on the Obesity Pandemic, lead researcher David Ludwig, and again, people like Gary Taubes, Ron Krauss, Jeff Folick, Eric Westman, all very well known in the keto space, uh, were a part of this paper as well. So wanted to bring it to you uh, first. Uh, there was also a really nice op-ed in MedPage Today. I didn't get a chance to get to it, but MedPage Today uh, from Dr. Ludwig. So go check that out as well. But thank you so much for being here today. I hope you enjoyed this Jimmy Make Science Simple. Uh, I like to bring you the latest and greatest studies out there. So thanks for watching and we'll be back. Get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the livinglowcarbshow.com.